Jessica Schwab, and as recent events have placed issues of social justice at the forefront of America, I sought out individuals within the fields of law enforcement and government intelligence to gain a deeper understanding of the trajectory of these national issues. Today, I will be discussing the findings of Dr. Geraldine Downey, the chair of Columbia University's psychology department, regarding juvenile incarceration with former prosecutor, former district attorney, and current public defender and private attorney, Jared Hart. Dr. Geraldine Downey, the chair of Columbia's psychology department, discusses the idea of the optimism and power that surrounds the identity of a college student versus the sort of death of hope and potential that surrounds the identity of a prisoner, sort of like a premature death. Uh, have you ever seen this transition occur within some of your clients, particularly those who encounter the criminal justice system at a very young age? I could have somebody that's 15 years old in the juvenile court, or I could have somebody at 18 years old. It's a big difference, um, but still considered a youthful offender. Their background first plays a, a large part in it. So if I get somebody that comes from a, from a strong family, has a strong family bond, has an intact household, has gone to school, um, whether it's public or private school, and are involved with their community and their education, um, I often find that, number one, being involved in the system is a, um, it's not a premature death, it's a death threat to them. What happens is they get extremely nervous that their entire future is over. I, you know, uh, it's not uncommon for me to get a 16-year-old, 17-year-old kid who just got his license to get a DWI. His mind is like, his life is over. Sometimes that's a good thing. It scares him straight. Um, there's other times, though, I'll get a kid in here that's 17 years old, um, and it could be the third time that he was, has been arrested or even the first. But oftentimes, the biggest difference I see is the community and the backgrounds of each of them, how they were raised and who they associate with. Um, there's an old adage with addiction, people, places, things. It's kind of the same concept with a young kid. Uh, the people they're around, uh, the places they live, and the things they're exposed to. So um, again, I get a 16-year-old kid whose brother may have been involved in the system or has been taken from his parents because of neglect or maltreatment and is in foster care, um, those children I often see a lot less hope and they are less concerned about their future and what happens to them in their case versus the child who comes from, I guess, a better environment. People you've known who have served a prison sentence, have you noticed any markers of change in their personas or perceptions of their future? Do former inmates see it as a learning experience or a very traumatic experience and that's all they view it as? To answer that, I think you need some context. There's three theories of, of um, punishment. You have retribution, you have deterrence, and you have rehabilitation. If somebody is in, has been incarcerated, it's either a theory of retribution or deterrence. Um, rehabilitation, we look at more programs or probationary type sentences. But that doesn't mean if they've gone to state prison, there's not a, a rehabilitative component. Um, for instance, if you have a drug problem and you meet the, the statutory criteria, you can maybe get a sentence of three years, but get court ordered a shock program. What's shock? Well, it's a six month boot camp. Um, it's, tr it's drug treatment and it tries to, um, give somebody the tools that they need to rehabilitate, uh, face their addiction, and reintegrate back into society. So on that three-year sentence, after six months, they're paroled. They're out. They're not serving three years. Um, somebody could get a 90-day Willard drug treatment program. Similar concept, except for that's, that's more focused on the education um, of, of abusing uh, substances. So after 90 days, they are then discharged from um, prison and paroled. It's important because these individuals, I see a lot more optimism because they know that if they do well in a program um, in Department of Corrections, that they will then be able to go home and serve out the remainder of their sentence on parole. And sometimes it sets them up for um, additional treatment when they're out um, through parole, and it's a good thing. Individuals who have no opportunities, no programs within Department of Corrections, I see a lot less optimism. 
Um, the problem is the sentencing guidelines. There's just some things you are not eligible for, um, which I think is a problem because it, it individuals don't even have the opportunity for hope. For instance, if I get a 19-year-old kid who has no record but um, breaks into his uncle's home and steals money for drugs, if he's convicted of that burglary, it's three and a half to 15 years in state prison if he's not adjudicated a youthful offender. Um, and that's classified as a violent crime in the state of New York. Violent, the violent category doesn't mean hurt anybody, but it changes the sentencing guidelines. That's what makes it three and a half to 15. So the judge essentially picks a number. Is it three and a half? Is it 10? Is it 12? Whatever it is. But because you have that violent classification, generally you're now ineligible for a lot of programs within state prison. So now this 19 year old kid uh, serving a sentence on a, on a violent crime may not be able to get the drug treatment that he needs. Um, so you see a lot of hope lost on something like that. Generally, I think that the older somebody is that I see in clients, the less hope they have. Um, when I have a young kid, I always tell them it's not the end of your life. If you're 21 and, and, and you're being sentenced to a few years, you'll be out when you're 25, you got the rest of your life ahead of you. Um, if I get a guy that's 50 years old, um, it's a little different. They have no hope. At, at that point, if, they, if, if they're going away in their minds, they, they've lost their family, they've lost their job, they're a blemish in the community, um, there's no coming back from it. So um, hope is an interesting thing because when you're locked up, a lot of people lose hope. Do you see many of the same clients more than once? I do. I see... Um, a lot of clients uh, more than once. So Dr. Downey also notes that being a college student inside of prison cuts the rate of recidivism by about 50 percent and there are also many statistics that have shown that higher educational attainment correlates with a lower crime rate. So what percentage of your clients would you say have either a high school degree or a college degree or even a doctoral degree? I obviously have a private practice, so I have private clients, and I also take assignments for the town of Liberty um, where I handle indigent clients and all of their criminal matters, both on the misdemeanor and the felony level. Why that's important is because I see a lot of times, because um, we're a poor county, we're a rural county, but we're a poor county, and I see oftentimes that clients have the ability to hire a lawyer are often the... Um, more educated clients um, and the clients that are assigned um, more often than not don't even have a high school diploma let alone a college degree or a doctorate um, which is a sad part about society but uh, that's the dichotomy that I see I think that education does play a role um, but in my personal opinion I think education is a small role in somebody's um, ability to become a repeat offender. Um, I say that because what I see more often is that there it's their socioeconomic factors that play a role into whether or not they're a repeat offender. It's where they grew up, it's how they grew up, and it's the people that they surround themselves with. Education is important in the sense that it'll give some people direction. And it gives them, you know, quote unquote, something to do. Um, obviously, in a rural area like this, if I if there's somebody that doesn't have a job and they're not willing to go to college and they're sitting around, they're more likely to offend or get into trouble um, or start using drugs or something like that. But outside of that, as an example, um, unless the, somebody is highly educated, so for instance, I'll I may represent a teacher. Um, which teaching is a big deal around here. Um, I don't see them coming back. Uh, they understand because what happens is when somebody has an education, it leads into a career. So they understand the impact on the criminal offense onto their career. Um, but going back, I, I find that the, the socioeconomic factors, I think, weigh much more into somebody's education. Dr. Downey also brings up 
that the new findings in neuroscience that evidence the, quote, longer period of brain malleability as well as of openness to social and cultural influence than was ever imagined in the past in regards to juveniles has been the impetus to not be so quick to deem a young person bad or to send them directly to prison. Prison will obviously irreversibly sculpt their perception of themselves and of life in general. Um, so do you think that there are more effective alternatives to prison for young people who do not have the guidance at home or the maturity to avoid engaging in illegal behavior? Yeah, and I think the state has already is starting to try to address that. It's recent. They've just created that um, certain crimes, this is a list of them, that those cases are diverted to family court rather than staying in the regular criminal court, i.e. adult court. Um, so you you could have a, a vehicular homicide, uh, and the, the, the person could be 17 years old, 16 years old, whatever it may be, and rather than being tried on the adult level, um, not forget about youthful offender status or whatever, um, they're being diverted to family court, and they're being handled there, which punishment is much different, and it's a lot more focused on rehabilitation. So I think the state has recognized that already, and I think they're making efforts to do that. Um, but yes, I think that a young person, depending on the crime, but in general, prison should not be the alternative. It should not be the first alternative at all. Um, because what happens is they come out, life has passed them by, their friends have gone on to get educations or jobs, they come out, they're now a convicted felon at a young age, and they don't know what to do. They're lost. Um, there should be more community, in my opinion, community-driven um, rehabilitation. What does that mean? Well, we have, we have businesses that can't find workers. People don't want to work. Um, why, why can't we have some type of on-the-job training that they're required to do this job? They'll get paid for it. they got to show up to work. they got to stay clean. Um, if they don't, then, they, then fine, they get locked up. Um, but the prize is they get to stay out. They get some on-the-job training, some vocational training, whatever it could be. I think that would be very helpful. I think it would help the community and the individual, teach them a skill and some education. They used to have a program in state prison, which they don't have anymore, it's unfortunate, whereby a certain number of years before somebody was expected to be released, they would be eligible to um, kind of like a workforce thing. So they would go out and maybe maintain all of the trails um, on state land. They'd be the ones with the chainsaws, cleaning the trails, making sure hikers have access and things like that. Um, and just cleaning up the state. Uh, they don't have that anymore. But maybe for, for young kids, rather than going away, they have a program like that. So there'd be supervision of them. Be, there'd be, they'd have like a probation officer or something supervising them. But they would also have to do a task. Um, and it would keep them busy on a daily basis. I think the, the hard part is, is if they have nowhere to live, um, you know, that's always tough, making sure they're not abusing drugs or alcohol, making sure they're reporting. You're always going to have your anomalies. Um, but that's just one example. Um, but I agree, I agree with the theory. Today, I will find out whether or not New York State statutes account for the neurological differences between the brain of a juvenile and the brain of an adult by discussing the neuroscientific findings of Elizabeth Scott, a professor of law at Columbia University, by sitting down with Justice Harold Bellman, who has sat on the Liberty Town Court Justice bench for over 40 years. So a juvenile is someone 18 or younger, and a young adult is somebody who is 18 to 21 years old. Some extend that age range to 25 years old. And according to a demographic database, the Neighborhood Scout, 18.3% of Liberty's population is between ages 5 to 17, and 8.6% is between ages 18 to 24. So this cumulative percentage of 26.9% constitutes the largest percentage of Liberty's population, with its second population being 21.8% of 35 to 54-year-olds. So. I was wondering what approximately is the percentage of cases within your court that involve juveniles or young adults? Uh, asking questions with regard to percentages of defendants uh, in my court or in any, any other court. 
it's something that uh, we really don't think about. We're here to do justice and do the right thing. Um, if I had to guess, I would think that um, 20, 25 percent. There are new discussions and debates that surround juvenile incarceration um, that have now emerged through the neuropsychological lens that propose questions that now ask how culpable really is a minor or how culpable really is a young adult. Elizabeth Scott, a professor of law at Columbia University, elucidated in her work entitled Brain Development, Social Context, and Justice Policy that the main difference between the underdeveloped mind of a young person and the more developed mind of an adult is that juvenile brains are, quote, more sensitive to rewards and more inclined towards reward seeking. And also that, quote, when adolescents are emotionally aroused by the anticipation of rewards in the presence of their peers, they tend to make riskier choices that they are less able to control than do adults. A study that was conducted at Temple University that Professor Scott cites, it was found that peer influences increases an adolescent's risk-taking tendencies even when they are aware of the consequences of their choices. So it appears that there is a preponderance of evidence that clearly distinguishes the mental capacity of a juvenile versus that of an adult. So do you think New York State's statutes account for this inherent propensity within teenagers to be more reckless and therefore susceptible to crime? Not really. Uh, the statutes uh, take into account the age uh, of the defendant, uh, the history of the defendant in terms of prior culpable acts and uh, school and how well this particular defendant uh, gets along with others. Um, but as far as the court is concerned, uh, we treat every defendant that comes before us uh, in terms of what they're capable of and what they've done. Um, I take into account uh, all the time, no matter who the defendant is, the uh, specifics of the uh, crime and uh, the behavior of the defendant in court and um, whether the defendant uh, realizes that what he or she has done is uh, is wrong in terms of our society. Um, but uh, I certainly do not rely on statistics to uh, generate justice in my court and do the right thing. So there are some critics of this position to reform um, the culpability of juveniles within the justice system, being that their brains are so much different than the brain of an adult. Uh, Professor Scott mentions this counter-argument that many people hold where they agree, well, not all adolescents are criminals, and so, as she says, quote, the normative, biological, and psychological factors associated with adolescence are unlikely to play the important role in juvenile offending posited by those supporting the reform trend, unquote. She counters their stance, however, by emphasizing that the crimes perpetrated by adolescents are usually the, quote, product of dynamic interaction between the still maturing individual and her social context, unquote. So the claim here is that there is so much more than one psychological immaturity that prompts illegal behavior. Um, so I wonder, do you find that this cognitive attribute is reflected in the charges of the younger criminals you have adjudicated? Um, again, I, I don't think it's proper, and I don't think it's a doing the right thing to lump together um, young adults in terms of an age group and their, um, uh, their adult counterparts. Um, I've never looked into the sociological uh, aspects of uh, human behavior. That's not my job. My job is to do justice on an individual basis. Um, and uh, I would be remiss if I would try to do justice based upon the statistical uh, aspect of, of, of review and, uh, and, and science. Um, 
So if you want to ask me about the specific case uh, or a specific class of cases, I could do that. But I have never taken into account the uh, behavioral aspects of a uh, juvenile as compared to an adult. I've seen juveniles that were much more capable of uh, forming ideas and patterns of behavior than adults. Uh, and I don't see how you can pick, compare one to the other uh, in terms of uh, age alone as opposed to um, inherited characteristics um, in terms of appreciating right from wrong, in terms of sociological behavior. Um, and uh, without criticizing anyone who is doing these reports, uh, I would tend to think that anyone who does uh, never tried a case and uh, doesn't rely upon what happens in a courtroom. So in New York State law, what is the difference in how a juvenile is tried versus how an adult is tried? You could have a, uh, a crime uh, which was allegedly committed by an adult or, or a juvenile where the elements of the crime differ because juveniles are tried to a different standard than an adult. And based upon the standard and the elements of a crime involving a ju juvenile, the case is totally different. The elements are different. As a matter of fact, in terms of juveniles, many juveniles are tried in family court. They aren't tried in a regular court, uh, such as uh, my court in terms of criminal acts. Sort of taking it to the extreme now, there was a case of murder in 2003. It was actually a landmark case, Roper v. Simmons, which involved the murder of a woman by a 17-year-old boy uh, for which he was sentenced to death as a juvenile. And it was later brought to the Supreme Court of the United States who struck down that life sentence in place of life imprisonment without parole. Uh, this result was achieved through the usage of sociological and scientific evidence uh, that showed just how impulsive and unstable juveniles can be, especially when compounded with a negative social environment, which the young man did grow up in. There seems to be a growing national consensus that juveniles should not be tried as adults, especially in murder cases where there is a possibility of life imprisonment or the death penalty. Do you foresee this type of evolution in the way we perceive juvenile killers or in the way we perceive juveniles who commit lesser offenses? That's a very interesting question. Uh, I haven't given it much thought, but I believe that the Eighth Amendment uh, has been, in terms of uh, evolution, has been changed, have been changed by the Supreme Court in deciding what penalties uh, are applicable and just in connection with the juvenile. Uh, in the question you posed, in the case of murder, uh, there was once a time when juveniles were subjected to the uh, death penalty. That's no longer the case. Uh, the Supreme Court has acted upon that and deemed that cruel and unusual uh, you know, treatment of a, uh, of a juvenile defendant. Um, and I think that uh, the court is in a state of flux, although I don't know how it's going to go in terms of it being... Uh, truly um, more conservative than it's been in the past uh, 30 years. Um, but I think uh, if Justice Ginsburg was still on the court, uh, she would hold in writing a, an opinion that uh, life imprisonment without the possibility of, of, uh, of par parole is cruel and inhuman in terms of a 17-year-old. Uh, uh, and I think the court is going that way, and uh, I foresee eventually the court holding that uh, that is in violation of the Eighth Amendment um, to sentence uh, a, a child to uh, life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. Uh, that doesn't serve society uh, in, in any way. Um, a person sentenced to uh, such a, uh, a draconian penalty uh, 
we might as well give up on life and all of the good things that he could do for society are not going to happen um, because of his uh, sentence to, for the rest of his life in, in, in a prison environment. Up next is an interview with the new chief of the Town of Liberty Police Department, Steve Degada, where I sit down and discuss with him the benefits, the shortcomings, and the practical applications of utilizing actuarial or statistical profiling methods within policing, as elucidated within the work of Bernard Harcourt, a professor of law and political science at Columbia University. So Bernard Harcourt, a professor of law and political science at Columbia University, discusses in his book, Against Prediction, Profiling, Policing, and Punishing in an Actuarial Age, the trend towards utilizing these actuarial or statistical methods within law enforcement, and the many overlooked shortcomings of relying on trying to predict past, present, and future crime. So how does the Liberty Police Department incorporate or utilize crime data about certain groups of people, say, of a specific location or ethnicity? So while we do use crime data to allocate resources in our policing, we don't draw from the data uh, any inferences or preconceived notions based on someone's vocation, race, ethnicity, or any of those characteristics. Much more frequently we'll use uh, things such as location, time, patterns of uh, conduct and crimes to focus our targeted efforts. So Professor Harcourt warns that utilizing these actuarial methods in policing may actually counterintuitively increase crime. He says that because it is nearly impossible to predict a certain group's responsiveness or elasticity of, defending, of offending to increase policing, it may allow the non-profiled group to commit more crimes because there is less of a police presence within that area. Do you notice that the greater police profiling of certain groups or of certain areas throughout Liberty has been successful at reducing crime? Or do you sometimes see the counterintuitive result occur within the non-profiled area? So that's an excellent point. One thing that we try and guard against is uh, implicit biases that all people have um, as we conduct our police work. I can't say that I've noticed an increase in crime in the uh, in individuals that may have been profiled based on their vocation or race or ethnicity, but I have seen a lack of trust and a lack of community togetherness that comes from, and not specifically with this department, but policing in general, if a uh, sp specific group of people feels that they are targeted because of their race, ethnicity, gender, religion, they lose trust in the police department, and without trust in the police department, they can't police a free society. So that would be what I would view as a major downfall to any bias-based or profile-based policing. So statistical evidence is most useful when it represents the larger population. And Professor Harcourt argues that these probabilistic methods to predict and prevent crime leads to that profile population becoming the majority of the overall carceral population. So do you find that this potential for inaccuracy is common among the way police departments gather crime data of certain populations of people, whether categorized by race, vocation, or neighborhood? So I could see how the potential for inaccuracies in that statistical data could be very problematic uh, for policing and for the community, which is why I think that in addition to any data, statistical or otherwise, that's gathered, it's important to make sure that police officers are part of the community that they serve. That way they have an actual pulse on uh, the neighborhoods, they understand what's going on, and they're not simply relying on uh, charts, data, and statistics to govern how they go about conducting themselves. Often, as you know, the profiled groups get pinned with a reputation for being a criminal, a potentially inflated reputation for being a criminal, um, which complicates their ability to obtain housing, employment, and education. Do you see this stagnating those who constitute the majority of Liberty's carceral population when they are released from prison or just generally? So when an individual is released from prison, there are a great amount of hurdles that they have to overcome to secure things like housing, employment that you stated. Uh, it almost seems in some instances like the system uh, is built against them once they get out. Uh, typically, they may be on parole, uh, which sometimes seems that uh, they have a large possibility of being uh, violated on their parole. 
Uh, we do see a, a high level of recidivism, especially with individuals that are released from state prison, and it seems like the current social structure that is in place is inadequate to help them facilitate a transition back uh, into free society. Up next, you will hear from Don Gorelli, a 25-year veteran of the FBI who is a special agent in charge of New York's Joint Terrorism Task Force, where we will discuss the findings of Matthew Waxman, the chair of Columbia University's National Security Program, on the difficulty of linking a suspect to an act of terrorism. During your career as an FBI special agent, you spent nine months in Pakistan after the September 11th attacks. What did your work entail, and what were you searching to find there? So when I first got to Pakistan, there were a lot of uh, potential Al-Qaeda members that had either passed through Pakistan, they had stayed in safe houses, or they had a network, uh, a support network in Pakistan, and we were trying to get as much information on the Al-Qaeda network as we could. And there were really kind of two main missions over there that I was involved in. Number one was trying to get the Pakistani law enforcement and intelligence services to give us what they knew on these various Al-Qaeda members. So that was one aspect of the job, was, was cooperation with the local government. And the second part is that there were still many Al-Qaeda members that were hiding out in Pakistan. And so we would go on operations with the Pakistanis to try to root them out and gather evidence. So many times we would go out at night, uh, the Pakistani officials would go in first and they would uh, arrest people, they would execute search warrants, and then we would go in with them to look for evidence, like computers, paper, documents, whatever we could to help um, build this intelligence network and also get evidence that we could use to build a criminal case in the United States. Did you ever deal with terrorists or suspected terrorists firsthand? Actually, I did um, a number of times. Uh, like I mentioned before, we would go to these various safe house locations, and when people were there, um, we would interview them with, of course, the cooperation of the Pakistani government. The one that I think is most notable in my mind, probably one of the biggest cases in my career that I worked on, was an individual that was in charge of the bioweapons program for Al-Qaeda. And I interviewed him over the course of several days with my uh, other counterparts from the government and with the Pakistanis. And we were able to get information from him that allowed us to uncover the location of a bioweapons laboratory in Afghanistan. And we actually took him with us to Afghanistan to the location and, and found the laboratory. It was in shambles, it had been bombed out, but there was plenty of um, evidence there that that's in fact what Al-Qaeda was using or one of the locations they were using uh, for a bioweapons laboratory. So yeah, I, I did um, deal with some terrorists firsthand and it was um, quite rewarding and worthwhile work. So Matthew Waxman, the chair of Columbia University's National Security Program, who's also a professor of law there, writes in his work entitled Detention as Targeting, Standards of Certainty and Detention of Suspected Terrorists, that linking someone to acts of terrorism beyond a reasonable doubt is extremely difficult. So what are some of these prosecutorial obstacles investigative teams usually encounter? It, he's right. It's, it's very difficult. Um, Many times when you are picking up a terrorist subject overseas, either um, in a foreign country or in the battlefield, it's a very dynamic and fluid situation. You are looking to get evidence that you can use to support your criminal case in the United States, but you're doing it in a foreign country. So number one, you need cooperation from that country. Also, there are chain of custody issues. Uh, you might pick up a computer disk, let's say, for example, in some safe house in Afghanistan, and it can be a challenge getting that admitted in court because of just the fluidity and the, and the way the, the information has been picked up and uncovered. And you also need, in some cases, 
real eyewitnesses, you know, people that maybe can support you and give testimony in court in the United States. They're oftentimes reluctant to testify. They're not angels themselves. They're co-conspirators. Maybe they're terrorists themselves. So their credibility can be taken, you know, into account. And then you just physically have to get them to the United States to put, you know, put their story, put them in front of a jury and let them tell their story. It's possible to do and we've done it, but it's, but it's a challenge and there's a lot of coordination between domestic law enforcement, the FBI, Department of Justice, CIA, State Department, foreign countries. It's not as simple as a criminal case that's, you know, basically in the United States and, and all, the, all the pieces are here at home. So the successful convictions of those who bombed the World Trade Center in 1993 appears to be maybe a sort of exception to these typical prosecutorial issues. What was different about that case? I, I don't know if it was necessarily different, but one of the, the main things with the World Trade Center bombing and, and any terrorist investigation overseas, you still want to have proper to the best extent possible, proper methods and rules of evidence and collection and all of the things that you would do in a domestic terrorism investigation, a domestic law enforcement investigation, you want to try to put those into to practice when you're picking people up overseas. One of the things that made it challenging post 9-11 is that we veered off the playbook a little bit and particularly with the enhanced interrogation techniques. And that now has become problematic because some of the information that was obtained and some of the, um, the amount of information that would be made public in discovery is not necessarily uh, information that can be put in front of a jury here at home. So I think the lesson learned there is you should, to the extent possible, try to follow the same rules when you're conducting an investigation overseas as you would here at home so that when you get the opportunity to put somebody on trial, you can use the information and not have it just locked in this classified box that you can never use. And again, that's unfortunately, we still have people sitting in Guantanamo that may never get a trial because of some of those very complicated issues. So moving into an evolving domestic issue, white supremacy. Uh, I know you've been retired for a bit, but what do you think the political or social future of America looks like if the kingpins of white supremacy groups with organizations like QAnon and the Proud Boys continues to go unchecked? I'm actually very worried about it. Um, we saw what happened on January 6th and it was disgusting uh, having you know these white supremacists and others marching through our capital. And social media has created this ability for these groups to trade information, uh, conspiracy theories, organize themselves, um, plot and train and do all the things that, that they want to do in furtherance of whatever their belief is. And um, it's very detrimental, I think, to our society. and, and you lay on top of that the ability to get weapons in this country, which is, which is not very hard. And it's, it's, it's a volatile situation, and I, I feel like it's, it's getting worse. And I know these are people are the extremes. They're not the mainstream. But it doesn't take, you know, we saw again January 6th. Um, if, if more people had actual weapons or you know assault rifles and whatnot it could have been a lot more uh, death and tragedy if that were the case so it worries me quite a bit i don't know exactly uh, what can be done other than 
you know, we, we also have a freedom of speech, right? So people are allowed to have views that aren't necessarily in agreement with, with mainstream, and they're allowed to, to have anti-government views. But there needs to be that balance of hate and plotting criminal activity and all of these, um, the, the type of, of, of rhetoric that led to January 6th, there, that needs to be balanced against First Amendment rights because we all have the right to have a, a free and open society without fear of militia groups invading our capital. As you've heard, there are no clear solutions to the complex social issues that affect Americans each day. What we can do, however, is to keep on investigating and keep on asking questions, even when they might be uncomfortable. Thank you for watching.